Welcome to Wednesday, February 10, the class session. And today I got some special examples for you to show you how to execute a discrete random variable and a binomial distribution, both on your calculator and in Excel. Now your calculator does many things automatically. And the problem sometimes with the calculator when it does it automatically is you press a button, you get a number, you write down the number, and then someone says, wait a minute, that's the wrong number. You press the wrong button. Or the calculator reports a number to you and you have no idea where that number came from. So the goal here is I will show you how the calculator calculates the number so that when you press this button, you have confidence in the answer it produces. There is no way that we want to do the calculations and the tables that you're starting to see by hand if we can avoid them. Sure, we can do them and it might take us an hour or two if we had a large table, but the calculator does these automatically. So I need to make sure that you know how it does it and that you believe in what it does. And if you had to reproduce a table, you could do it on your calculator because you guys did a really nice job with some of your tables on the last homework. And in this current homework that we posted, we do have, I think a table or two that you have to produce. Okay, let's get back to a discrete random variable. So remember a discrete random variable is simply, remember we got throw, lots of jargon thrown at you, but discrete random variable is an experiment. That I describe verbally I describe in words. And we commonly use capital letter X for discrete random variable. Or if you're writing and you can't tell big X's from little X's, try X Roman numeral with feet and a hat on it. The values of a discrete random variable are numbers. They are the possible outcomes of the experiment. So let's hop right into an example. Now to give you a preview, later we're gonna talk about continuous random variables. So let's just focus on discrete random variables today. And that means you got a finite set of outcomes, you know, the six sides of a die, the red or black playing cards. Whereas if I was talking about the height of the people in the classroom or the speed of the cars on the freeway, well, those are continuous things. Some cars are going 60, some cars are going 60.1, some cars are going 63, 64, 64 and a half. The cars on the freeway are driving anywhere from 60 to 90 miles an hour. But if I roll a dice, I don't get somewhere between two and three. I only get one, two, three, four, five, or six. So let's focus on that. Let's define a discrete random variable. Uh, I am noticing this on my side, and you may be noticing this on your side. I am getting some bandwidth issues so that my thing is a little bit jerky, but the recording should still be solid. So if you have to go back to the recording later to get exactly what I said, I apologize. Let's let X be the discrete random variable 
called the number rolled on one six-sided fair die. And I, I, I appeal to dies, die, dice, cards often because there are things that we can hold in our hands and do. So when I say to you, the number rolled on one six-sided fair die, then you know what I'm talking about. You can pick up a dice, you can roll it, you can find out what number you get. What are the values of this discrete random variable X? I'll try to make it a capital X and a lowercase x. Well, ordinary six-sided die, the values are little x values. So we use little x for values, capital X for the variable, the discrete random variable. The values for little x can be one, two, three, four, five, or six. Those are the only things that can happen when you roll one six-sided fair die. So now let me show you what the probability distribution function is for this discrete random variable, for this experiment. Remember, sometimes people abbreviate this as probability distribution function. And I think that's not a bad idea because it saves you the trouble of writing this out. You could abbreviate discrete random variable as discrete random variable, although you don't see people do that very often. So let's make a table. And this is what this is all about today. Your calculator will do this for you automatically. But I want to show you that if you had to make the table by hand, you could, and you could use a calculator to back it up. So the values are one, two, three, four, five, and six. And the probability distribution function, make sure I got a certain paper in front of me, is nothing more. It sounds very fancy, but it's nothing more than the probabilities, the complete probabilities of this experiment. Now, you roll a dice, it's got six sides, the dice is equally weighted. So you say, I've got a one in six chance of getting each one of these numbers. And that's true. My dice just froze mid-roll there, didn't it? So I am going to write down one sixth for all six of these probabilities, but I'm going to write it down in decimals. Not because I like doing decimals, but it's because the calculator does. And I want to show you how it's going to look when you write on the calculator screen. One six, six, seven is one sixth to four decimal places. And let's make the agreement right now that we will use four decimal places in all of our calculations rounding off. And because the calculator or because we know that the probability is equal for all six sides of this dice, there is the entire probability distribution function. Now, remember, this has two special properties. What is a probability distribution function? It has two special properties. All the probabilities are between zero and one. So you cannot have a probability of negative four. You cannot have a probability of two. Something can't happen 200% of the time. These say 16.67% of the time I roll a one. And the second key truth about a probability distribution function is all the probabilities sum to one. 
That means I've accounted for everything. And if you add up these six copies of one sixth, decimal or fraction, you do get one. Now, let's do a little minor surprise and add to this table. What happens if we multiply x times p of x in each row? Now again, I don't wanna do this as a human, but I'll do this once and then show you how to reproduce it on a calculator or computer. So one times that 0.1667 is not hard. It happens that two times one sixth is one third, which is three, 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 three. Three times one sixth is three six, which is zero, five, zero, zero, zero. And then four six, I'm just filling in the numbers that I know. These are the decimal equivalents of one sixth, one third, one half, two thirds, five six, and uh, last one has to be one sixth again. I'm sorry, six times one sixth is one. Now, what is the value of these numbers? The super cool thing about these numbers is that they add up to the mean or average value of the experiment. So if you added up these numbers here, you'd get a little kind of tiny surprise. Now I'm not gonna add them up by carrying and stuff like that. We'll add them up on the calculator in a second. But if you add these up, you get 3.5. Okay, so that's communicating to you that the mean of this discrete random variable, let's use the letter mu, the Greek letter mu, is the sum, that's a fancy mass symbol that means add them all up, of all the numbers in that column. And in this problem, that is equal to 3.5. Now I want you to think about that for a second. When you roll a dice, the average value is 3.5. First of all, you reject that or you feel very nervous because you say, I never roll a 3.5. Every time I roll, I get another number, but I don't get 3.5. But let's think about it. You get these numbers one through six, right? And each one occurs with an equal probability. So, right down the middle is the average value. If you roll a six and a seven, the average is 3.5. If you roll two and a five, the average is 3.5. If you add three and a four, the average is 3.5. So that looks surprising the first time you see it, but it's actually true. Okay, now let's calculate standard deviation. And that's gonna be another column in our table. And it, it's a little bit fancier, but I'll show you how to execute it here. And then let's execute it on the calculator. What you do to do the standard deviation is take the deviation of each value from the mean, and then you square that and then you multiply that times how likely it is. You multiply that by the probability. Now I've already done this on a calculator, so I can tell you, or a calculator or computer, what those numbers are. I am not just crunching these numbers in my head. So don't think I'm some kind of number genius or anything like that. Let's just let me write down the numbers and then I'll show you how to do them on your calculator. If I take one minus 3.5, that's 2.5 negative. If I square that, that's, oh, let me get out my calculator because I can't do it in my head. So one minus 3.5, 
one minus 3.5 is minus 2.5, you square that, and you get 6.25, but then you multiply that times one sixth, and you get 1.0417. Now do that for all these numbers, two minus 3.5, and you square it. Then you multiply it by one sixth. And you get 0 0.3750. And I'm just going to fill in the rest of these numbers here. 0 0.417, 0 0.417, 0 0.3750 and 1.0417. Notice these one and six are equally distant from 3.5. And so, and they have equal probabilities. So this table is symmetric. Now let's sum these numbers right here. When I sum these numbers, again, I'm having a calculator do this. I get 2.9167. So this number is called the mean. This number is called the variance. And people generally refer to the variance as S squared, because when you take the square root of the variance, you get S standard deviation. You got to make sure my paper is nicely centered here. Excuse me. Yeah, so far I got lucky. So now I know the standard deviation for this experiment. And I'll give you a demonstration about what that means. We use the letter sigma for standard deviation. Uh, we use S in a special case too, but right now let's use sigma. Sigma is like the Greek S. And by the way, that is called a lowercase sigma, the circle with a little line hat on it. And the uppercase sigma is a thing that looks like a funny E or a backwards three. I do have lag issues here in this. So I take the square root of the variance, square root of this number 2.9167. And what I get is approximately 1.7017. Now we could talk about how many digits is appropriate for me to write down, but I'm not gonna get in trouble if I write down four digits. Some people say it like this, the mean is 3.5 and they report one more digit of accuracy than the data itself. So the data went to the nearest unit. So mean goes to the nearest half unit. And then the same thing with the sigma. Some people like to say it like this. Since I used the nearest tenth to report mu, the mean, I will go to the nearest hundredth to report sigma, standard deviation. But I won't have any problem if you use this as standard four digits all the way across. Make sure you round off properly. Now let's put this into the calculator. And I'm gonna share my calculator screen with you. If I can find it, it's gotta be somewhere. There it is. Sharing, finding the calculator screen before I share it. Okay, excuse me. There's the calculator screen, we're sharing it. Let's go to a blank calculator screen.
Let me show you how to do this entire table and this entire calculation just by pressing a few buttons. So I'm going to go to, and if you ever need me to repeat a button, just let me know why we're doing this, but I'm gonna go to stats and I'm gonna edit my stat lists. I've already played with some of these here. So I am going to delete some of these lists just so you can see me do this from scratch. So here I am, and I'm gonna make the table like I made writing on my paper. In fact, on my paper, and I'll come back to my paper, I will label the paper with the same labels that I have on my calculator screen in front of you. So in list one, I want to put the values of the discrete random variable. I want to type one, two, three, four, five, and six. I just literally press the buttons one, two, three, four, five, and six. And in list two, I want to put the probabilities of each one of these outcomes. I'll show you a fast way to do it. So I could type one sixth return, one sixth return, one sixth return. Okay, that's good, but that's gonna take me a little bit of time, especially if I had a long list, not just six values. Let me erase that. Remember how to erase a list? You go up to the list name L2 and you just hit clear on your calculator. Now that list is erased. Let me show you how to fill this in with a special command on your calculator called sequence. And I will write down where to find this in a second, but I'll just go through the buttons now. Sequence is on the list menu. Second function, list. Let me clear this keystroke screen so you can see the keystroke. Second function, list. It says stat, second function stat, because you're reaching this blue thing called list. And then you go to, oh, my fault. I didn't hit second function list properly. There we go, that's better. So now I go to the ops menu, which stands for operations, and I go to the sequence menu which stands for sequence. Okay, I wanna do that once again, just so you see the keystrokes. Second function, list, ops by arrowing over one, and then I choose number five, sequence. And here I can type in an expression like one sixth. I want the calculator to write one sixth in that whole column. And it's gonna be constant. The variable, let's call it X or N, you can call it anything you like, but I want it to write one sixth in that column L2 starting one time until six times, stepping one at a time. Let me show you what that looks like. So start at one, end at six. I want to write it six times and one step at a time. On the calculator screen, it looks like this. And what I get is six copies of one sixth. But I don't want it on my calculator screen. I want it in that list. So it's clear, clear. Let's go back to stats, edit the stats list, and now go up to L2. Don't stand in the first cell. Go up to L2 and hit enter. And now that you have your cursor there, repeat that sequence command. Second function list, ops, sequence number five. And notice that it's still there from the last time you used it. Now when I hit enter, 
on each of these values and see the command set equal to L2, watch what happens. I put the one sixth in for each of these. Now you're not like, it's so totally impressed with that. But let's say you had a list of 50 different things. You don't want to type one six 50 times. Okay, so let's compare to my, stop sharing. Let's compare to my paper. I've put these two columns now in the calculator. Let's put this column in the calculator and I'll put it in column L3. So I go back to sharing my calculator. And what I want to do is multiply columns L1 and L2, literally. So all I have to do is move upward to L3 and then hit enter and then type L1 times L2 and it'll multiply each of these entries. Second function L1 is down here on the one. Second function list one times second function list two. That is very nice. You copy the whole column at one stroke and you multiply each entry in those two columns in one stroke. And again, it's not very exciting if there's only six entries, but what if there were 60 entries? You see the numbers there that I wrote on my paper. I'm gonna hop back to my paper. <coughs> These numbers are now on the calculator screen. <clears throat> How could I add up those numbers really quickly? Let me show you another function for adding up those numbers really quickly. Let's say I have a list and I want to add up the numbers in list three. <clears throat> Back to calculator. So I am working on the table. I'll come back to the table, but how do I add up the numbers in L3 really quickly? Let's get out of the table and let's use the sum command, which is under math. Under math, sorry, under list math, my fault. I'll show you the keystrokes. List, math, number five is sum. So I hit five. And then I type in the column I want to add up. I want to add up column L3. When I sum column L3, this is what I get. 3.5. You're not surprised about that because you knew it was going to sum to 3.5. Remember on my paper, we added those up to 3.5. Okay, now if that column impressed you, let's try this column because this column is a very busy column. You're doing several calculations here, but I want to do them in the calculator automatically. Okay, so let's put this in list four. And I'll show you how to do it. So back to calculator screen. And back to my stats. Edit. Let's go up here and make list four, like I have on my paper. Now, what is list four? List four is going to take x minus the mean for every one of these six values, x, and then going to square it, and then going to multiply it by list two. So I'm going to use that sequence command again. Hit enter. Notice the cursor is not in this lower line on L4 right now, but I hit enter. Now the cursor is in L4. Now I'm going to go do the sequence command again. So the sequence command is what? Second function, list, ops, sequence, number five. And I'm going to change this to not one sixth there in that column, but I want to take x, sorry, x minus the sum of list three. Where was sum? Sum was under second function, list, math, sum. 
And I want to do the sum of list three, second function list three. I'm sorry, list three. Yes, no. Yes, it was list three because that's going to give me the mean. Then parentheses. So now I'm doing serious menu digging right here. And then I want to square that. Hit the square key. And I want to do that. This is where the variable item comes in. I want to do that for every X in column one. I want to start at the first entry to the sixth entry, one step at a time, and then paste that on my command line. Now it's pasted here in L4, but I don't just want that. Remember back to my paper. I want to multiply x minus mu squared times p of x, which is column two. So let's go back to calculator and multiply by L2. And here we go. These are the numbers that I had entered by hand from the calculator button pressing one at a time. Do you see that those are the same numbers as we wrote on the paper here? Now, how do I calculate standard deviation? I sum up those numbers and then take the square root. Let's do that on the calculator. So I want to sum this list L4 and then take the square root of it. So let's get out of the table. I'll clear this screen. I'm gonna sum the list. And remember the sum command is under list math, number five, sum list four. And that gives me the variance, which I already wrote on a paper, 2.91667. You see, we wrote that on the paper right there, 2.9167 when I went to four digits. That's called the variance. It happens to be the square of sigma, the square of the standard deviation. But if I want the standard deviation, I'm going to take the square root of that. Back to calculator. And I can do that just by hitting square root. And then this is an interesting key right here. See on the bottom row where it says answer? I can say square root of the last answer. And that'll do the square root of the sum of L4 for me. That'll take the square root of 2.9166, et cetera. I could have also said square root of the sum, sorry, the sum number five of L4. I could have typed it in all at once like that. I would get the same number. Okay, this is not the most beautiful, exciting part yet. So let's say that I know these things now and I wrote them on my paper. Mean, 3.5. Standard deviation, 1.7078. In fact, in case you need to make a table for one of the problems in your book, or one of the problems on your exam next week, do you see that we've made this exact table on your calculator screen? And that alone would be enough to pay for this calculator. You know, that alone would say, okay, I like that. I don't want to do this by hand. But the calculator has another secret weapon. So we made this table to calculate the mean and the standard deviation. The calculator will calculate the mean and the standard deviation automatically just with a press of a button. So look at list L1. Those are my six outcomes in this experiment, right? Go to this key, hit stat, 
And instead of edit, let's calculate. And let's calculate one variable statistics. That means I just got one variable X that I'm working with. If you hit enter here, the calculator will do the mean and the standard deviation for you. In fact, it'll do mean, standard deviation, median, quartiles, high, low. I mean, you've maybe already used this, but I just wanna reinforce with you that you can use it on this problem and it matches exactly what the table produced. So let's do list one. Leave the frequency list blank. I'll show you another option in a second and calculate. And look at in the blink of an eye, the calculator said the mean is 3.5. That's the symbol X bar that it uses for mean. It says the standard deviation. Now we said sigma, we're calling sigma standard deviation 1.7078. This other SX is standard deviation too, but in a different context. The calculator just reports it either way. We want, in this case, 1.7078. Look what else the calculator says. There were six values. The minimum was one. This first quartile was two. The median, which is the second quartile, is 3.5. The third quartile is five. And the maximum was six. So it gives me the total rundown of list one. Now, the reason I show you the table and show you this screen. Remember I got to the screen by saying, just stats, calculate, one variable statistics, is to show you that the result of this table is the same as if you let the calculator do this work automatically. The work that I did calculating from this table is reproduced by the calculator. Then you're saying, why do I ever need to make a table? Well, in certain problems where you got a more complicated situation might be paying off to make the table and to see the values yourself. Also, I want you to worry about this. When you do the one variable statistics, it reports lots of different numbers to you. Now I'm interested, excuse me, and the 3.5 and the sigma x. But how did I know I didn't want the sx? I can also display the table here on my calculator screen. There we go. Sorry, I don't want table. I want list. There we go. So this screen on the left is doing the same work as we did in this table on the right. I have to be careful. Am I sharing the calculator screen? Yes, I am. So sometimes I don't get the indication I'm sharing the calculator screen. So right now, just focus on the X bar, which is the calculator's way of saying mu, and on the sigma X, which is the calculator's way of saying sigma. I also want to show you that you could have done that calculation differently by saying one variable statistics, and you could have put in for the frequency list, the probabilities in list two. And sometimes we need to do that. I will get the same answers in a slightly different form. Do you see now the calculator does not fill in the S of X standard deviation, it only fills in the sigma and the X bar, but it doesn't put a little mu there for us. Notice the calculator says that when it summed the X's with the frequency list, it got 3.5. That's the summing of the product of X and the probability. That's the summing of list three over here on the right. I wanted to make that larger and I couldn't make it larger. Okay, now let's show you how we can make great use of this. Now this was a simple, well, let's just say it, a small discrete random variable problem. And I want to write down how I got lists one, two, three, and four. 
So I did list one by using the sequence command. Sequence x x one six one, and that is on that screen. What screen is it on? It's on the list screen, and then the ops screen, and then you choose five. So I'm going to write down how I made each one of these lists for everybody who's you know viewing this at home. And the list two. I made by doing also the sequence command, except I put one sixth in each place for each variable X. Starting at one, ending at six, one step at a time. That's what those three numbers mean. So this was also under list ops five. How did I do list three? I'm running out of space, but I'll scrunch it in. I did list three by multiplying list one and list two. I literally took list one times list two on the calculator. And then I could sum list three to find my mu. So summing to find the mu, I did that by sum list three. And the sum command is under list math. I wrote that too small. Let me write it again list math five okay so there's an explanation of how i wrote these uh i didn't squeeze in how i wrote list four so let me show you how i wrote list four list four well, i gotta raise the paper here but at least it's on the paper i did the sequence of x minus the sum of list three and then i squared that number using it for every x one six one times and then i multiplied that sequence on the same line by the probability list L2. That's how I created these numbers. Okay, let's go to a little more ramped up version of this to show you something I cannot easily do on the calculator. So I'm going to share screen with you again, but this time I'm going to share Excel screen. So this is page one today. Let's start page two. And I'll share an Excel screen. And this Excel spreadsheet is on our website if you want to look it up later. Let me find the name of it for you. It's called, it's on the technology section of our weekly webpage. Discrete, random, variable, oh, sorry, I got to repeat. Reload this page. It's a long name. Comparison with calculator. Okay, I'm going to share that and it ends in 
dot x l s x. First, I'll show you where to find that on my website, and then I'll open up the window. So you're looking at my website right now for week five. So remember, under technology, I give you some things you can play with here. And so discrete random variable comparison with calculator. You could download the spreadsheet that I'm about to show it you and play with it yourself. Okay, so let's share the spreadsheet. Uh, I got to open it up. There it is. Now we're looking at a spreadsheet that I've pre-made and I've pre-filled in the numbers. But I used the power of the spreadsheet to fill in the numbers. I did not get anything different than the calculator screen. I did not get anything different than the calculator one variable statistics demand. But I've added some value to this spreadsheet in another way. So first of all, I have the numbers x, one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then I typed one sixth into this sheet, into this cell here, cell B12. And then I just pulled that down, put one sixth in every cell. Then look at, I multiplied the X cell times the P of X cell to make this value X P of X. And then I literally, it's called pulling down. You put my cursor on the corner of that cell and drag it down and Excel fills in all the numbers. I did the same thing here. I took X minus the sum of the XP of X's, X minus mu, squared it, and multiplied it by the probability column. Now, one thing is special about the red cell right here. If you see it in my command line at the top, you see the dollar sign in front of the C and the dollar sign in front of the 18. That's cell C18. But the purpose of the dollar signs there is to fix that cell so that every time I do this formula, I use the same red cell. So I'll get a little Excel tutorial here. But I can still pull down the cell and get the same value as I did on my calculator. Okay, let's look at what I get. There's the mean 3.5. That's what was reported to me on the calculator. There's the variance 2.9167. That was reported to me from the calculator. And the square root of variance is 1.7078. That's the sigma. Now, why would I want to reproduce this again since I just did it already? What I did is over here on the right in red, I told Excel to roll some dice. You know, I want to roll dice and see if these numbers are true or see if they're believable. So what I can do right here is just A little bit mysterious, but let's say I put my cursor on the delete cell in G7, press delete in cell G7, and watch every time I hit the delete key. I roll the dice 36 times. This is something your calculator won't do easily because I could do 36 times in Excel or I could do 36,000 times in Excel just by making the square bigger. But you see, what is the mean of these 36 rolls? It was 3.4167. Now that's not exactly 3.5, but it's darn close. I don't expect it to be exact. This is just an experiment. What does it say my standard deviation is for these red cells? 1.81. 62 again not the same as 1.7078 but close every time i hit delete 
Do you see those numbers change? And they do change, but they're not perfectly what I saw in my table. They're just an experiment. Now, how is this of value to me? Well, I'm gonna let you play this game independently because I wanna move on to something else. But what if we change this game? Now let's think about this. This is also in the same spreadsheet. Let's put some money into this so it gets interesting. Let's roll the dice. And every time you roll a six, you pay me $6. But every time you roll anything else, I pay you that many dollars. I pay you $3. I pay you $1. I pay you $4. I pay you $1. I pay you $3. I pay you $4. I pay you $2. Oops, you pay me $6. What do you think about this game? The question is, is it a good game for you to play? You don't win a lot of money each time often. You only win $1. Well, oh, there you won $5. Oh, you just lost $6. There you won $2. So you win more often than you lose, but the payouts for you aren't as big. Could we turn this into an experiment that I can calculate mean and standard deviation with. Sure, do you see, all I have to do is use the same table, but this time the X column does not stand for what's showing on the dice. The X column stands for the payout or the profit you make from playing this game. So if you roll a one, you get $1, $2, $3, $4, But if you roll a six, you lose $6. The probabilities are still the same. But now when I multiply the X column times the P of X column and add together, do you see what the sum is? The mean of this game is 1.5. Now, what does that mean? No pun intended. That means the average value of this game is positive $1.5 for you. Even though you could lose big and you might lose big a couple times in a row. The fact that you, oops, you just lost again. The fact that you, oops, you just lost again. The fact that you don't lose too often and that you still pick up money means what? It means even though this game can have a big loss for you, it's actually in your advantage to play this game. So the mean is $1.50. Every time you play this game, you're averaging $1.50 of winnings. You never win $1.50, you just average $1.50. I can calculate the standard deviation, the variance, just like before, with this square of the deviations times probability column. Notice the standard deviation is 3.5, big standard deviation, 3.6. That means you win on average $1.5, but there's some pretty big swings in this game. You know, you could lose as much as $6, and you can win as little as $1. Now let's go over here to the blue square. In the blue square, what I did is played the game 36 times, but notice all my sixes got minus signs in front of them. So I want to see what I win and lose when I play this game 36 times. Let me put my cursor on the cell, G27, any cell will do and hit delete. Okay, so in the first experiment, I won $1.44. Oh, I only won 36 cents that time because I rolled a lot of sixes. 30 cents, dollar six, dollar five, two, four, four. I won almost two and a half dollars in that roll. 
because of these 36 rolls, I only rolled two sixes. <coughs> Dollar one. I wonder if I ever lose money. I suppose if I rolled a lot of sixes, I could lose money. Ooh, that time, notice that. I only won eight cents. Why did I only win eight cents? So I rolled a pile of sixes. Look at that, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven sixes. That's unusual. Out of 36 times, I expect maybe to roll six sixes. Okay, how do you feel about this game? It's a game of chance. You could lose. But do you see as we go along, you're usually winning money. And according to our experiment, I'm usually winning, according to this table, $1.50. But it can vary, and I admit it can vary. Okay, you could do this with a dice at home, right? Play it with your brother or sister, mom or dad, uncle, aunt, whatever, cousin, niece, nephew. And you make sure that you're on the right side of this game and of course, sooner or later, they'll figure out that it's not a good game for them, but you might have some fun in the meantime. And then you can return their money. I mean, don't make enemies over a little game. Okay, so I want you to play with that spreadsheet. Now I want to describe another experiment to you. So I'm gonna close this spreadsheet, get out of here, good. Let me get out of that spreadsheet. I got too much clutter on my desk. I got rid of the clutter. I got all these message and notification windows. Let's get out of those. Okay, now let's talk about a binomial distribution. A binomial distribution. And this is specifically related to your second homework problem this week. So try this out. A binomial distribution. Is. A discrete random variable just like we did a second ago, but it's got two more special properties. It has just two outcomes. And the outcomes are called success and failure. And now by that, I mean you flip a coin. Heads, you win. Tails, I win. And so you would call heads success and you would call tails failure, right? So what we're talking about here is section 4.3 in your textbook. But I'm kind of curious what this experiment would look like. Uh, one more condition here. There is a fixed number of trials. You repeat this over and over again, flipping a coin 20 times, rolling a dice, 20 times, 18 times. Uh, your homework problem says throwing a pass 29 times. And I watched some of the Super Bowls, kind of interesting, and I kind of kind of a sports aholic in general. So 
I wanted to show you that you can even use probability and statistics when you talk about sports. In fact, people do that in a big way. So what happens when you throw a pass? It can be caught or not caught. When it's caught, it's called a completion. When it's not caught, it's called an incompletion or an interception. Caught by the other team does not count. That's not good. So Tom Brady made 21 out of 29 attempts completed in the Super Bowl. And you within your rights to say, is that normal? <coughs> or was that better than normal? Actually, if you look at Tom Brady's stats for the year, that's a little bit better than he did during the year. During the year, he completed about 66% of his passes. And by the way, so did Patrick Mahomes. But in the Super Bowl, Brady completed uh, 21 out of 29. Let me write that down. Uh, what is That's about 72%. So Brady was a little bit better than his average in the Super Bowl. I think Mahomes was a little bit worse. Now, that is not the whole Super Bowl, right? There was reasons why Brady was a little bit better and Mahomes was a little bit worse. Mahomes was getting pummeled, rushed, chased everywhere. But we're not going to talk about football. Let's talk about a discrete random variable with two outcomes, success and failure, and a fixed number of trials. Like, let's play this game 20 times. How many times do you win? So here's an experiment. And I'm going to go back to dice. And we can do this dice on the computer or on an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, I'm going to do it on a calculator, excuse me, so you can see it done on a calculator. So let's say x is rolling a fair. Six-sided dice, six-sided die. Uh, I'm going to pick a round number, 18 times. And recording the number of times I rolled a one. So I am not going to roll this dice 18 times, right? That takes too long. But I could have a computer roll it 18 times or 18,000 times. But you know that I'm going to get a 1 sometimes, and I'm not going to get a 1 other times. I haven't hit a 1 yet. I better not roll until I get a 1. That's a different question. So now. Let's see what could happen in this experiment. And this requires more space, definitely more space. Because let's check this out. If you roll this 18 times, what are the values? Be careful, there's a little trick right here. You say, I could roll a one, one out of 18 times, two out of 18 times, three out of 18 times. Four, five, six out of 18 times, seven, eight, nine out of 18 times, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Ah, do you remember which one I missed though? I could roll a one no times out of 18, right? So do you see I have 19 values here? Because I could roll a one no times. I have a feeling that that's not likely, but it's possible. I could roll a one 18 times in a row. I have a feeling that's not likely, but I suppose it's possible. That's interesting, between the zero ones and the 18 ones, 
you know that both of them are not likely but possible. Which one is more unbelievable? Rolling a one no times or rolling a one 18 times? I'll let you think about that because we'll know the answer in a second. Okay, now let's make our table. I got to even see if I have space for 18 columns. So let's count up from the bottom. 18, 15, 12, 9, 6, 3. My gosh, if I put my paper at the very bottom line, I think I'll fit 18 in here because I have to fit 19 values, right? 17, 16. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Am I missing any numbers? 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. I guess I didn't have to start that far down. No, but I was being safe. Now here's the problem, and already you know what I don't want to do. I do not want to create a table for this problem because that is 18 lines of four-digit numbers. And I don't know how to create the probability for this experiment yet. What is the probability that I get no ones? Well, technically, it's the probability that I got five six because not rolling a one has a probability of five six, but I'd have to do five six 18 times in a row. I'll write that on my calculator for you and then fill it in. Five divided by six, but five divided by six to the power 18 multiplied by itself 18 times. That is zero point zero three seven six. Round it off. How about rolling 18 ones? Now you'll see what I mean by which one is least likely. What about one sixth multiplied by itself 18 times? Change that five to a one. The calculator says, and I'll show it to you on the screen, 0.9846 times 10 to the minus 15th. That means this number, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 15. So I moved that decimal place. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 times. That is how unlikely it is to roll 18 ones. You know, you might roll 18 times and never see a one, that's a little bit less than 4% of the time. But here's rolling 18 times and only seeing ones. That's ridiculous. That's got to be, well, it can't be called impossible because it could happen, but maybe never seen in the history of the universe. Okay, so, but here's your problem. You do not want to do these calculations. And then the next column, the next column, next column. So your calculator will do these calculations automatically for you. Let me show you. And even better, do the calculations and produce a cool graph. So this is inside your calculator. We are going to build this table. inside your calculator. And your homework problem this week too, make the table inside your calculator. Don't 
do 29 rows of possible passes for Tom Brady. Okay, and I'll write down what I'm doing as I do it here, but let's write in list. Let me go back to the calculator now. And here's my calculator. And you know what I got to do. I'm going to get rid of the stuff I did previously. So I clear L4, clear L3, clear L2, and clear L1. But now I'm going to write 0 to 18 in L1, right? And I do not want to do that one at a time, so I'm going to use the sequence command. Go up to highlight L1. Don't put the sequence command here. Put the sequence command on L1. And let's do the sequence command. We're going to do a second function list ops sequence number five and make it simple. Just produce X. Yeah, sorry, I'm hitting the wrong key. X, the variable X, one at a time from one, actually from zero. I got to change that to a zero to 18, one step at a time. So I'm just going to type the value X from X equals zero to X equals 18. That means zero, one, two, three, four, all the way up to 18. Paste it in there. There's the command. That means type X for X from zero to 18, one step at a time. There's my 18 numbers. That sure beats typing in 18 numbers. Okay, now I'm gonna do the probability that I wrote on my paper, but I cannot calculate these one at a time. So I'm gonna use another function. So L1, I put in sequence, x, x, one, six, one. Now in L2, I'm gonna put these probabilities. I'm writing this on the paper so I can scan the paper later. You don't have to look at the paper right now. So you find this under this key, fourth row, fourth button called distributions. Let's go up to L2 and do, let me clear my keystroke window, second function distributions. And I want to thumb through these. These are some distributions we're going to use later in the class, but this is the first one the binomial probability distribution function. This is specifically for a binomial distribution. If I hit enter right now, it says, how many trials do you want to do? I want to do 18 trials. What's the probability of success? Success is rolling a one, so probability is one six. What X value are you interested in? Like you wanna know the probability of rolling seven ones. Well, yeah, I could do that for every line in the table. But if you leave that X blank, then the calculator will just give you all of them and put it in the table. Watch. There's all of them in the table. Do you see the first one is the 0376? Go way, way down to the last one. Whoops, I went past it. 1 times 10 to the 14th, that's way, way small. So that's that last number that I wrote down, although it's abbreviated so much you can't see it in the screen here. Look at this. Look how unlikely it is to roll eight ones. Zero, zero, four, two, and then the zeros cart raining down. You're gonna roll nine ones? I don't think so. You're gonna roll 10 ones? I don't think so. But here's the probabilities written into your calculator. Okay, now let's make a cool graph and let's figure out the mean and the standard deviation. So how did I do that L2? What I did, again, was clear keystrokes. I was up at L2. I did second function distributions.
And then I went down to number A, which is way down the list, called the binomial probability distribution function. Then I filled in the trials, 18 trials. Probability of success is one sixth and leave the X value blank. And then I put that in the list. Okay, let's go back to my list. Now, I want to do the mean, the median, the standard deviation, okay? But I have a very cool break for a binomial probability distribution. In the binomial probability distribution, there are simple formulas for the mean and the standard deviation. Really simple formulas to write down. I'll write them down here for you. Formula for the mean is just the number of trials times the probability. So if I did 18 trials and the probability of winning each time was one sixth, then I get the mean is three. The standard deviation is the square root of the number of trials times the probability of winning times one minus P, which is the probability of losing. Now that is the square root of 18 trials times one six times five six. Five six is the probability of not getting a one. So the standard deviation in this case, if I put it on my calculator, what is the square root of 18 times one sixth times five six? Sorry, I mistyped that. I get 1.58. I just typed that into my calculator. But I wanna see this visually. Let's say I played this game 18 times. What's the probability of each one of these numbers visually? The calculator is gonna do an excellent job at that. Watch. Oh, by the way, if you want to know those two numbers, I just calculated the three and the 1.58, we could just do stats right now. Stats, calculate, one variable statistics, use list one and list two, and then calculate. There's the three and the 1.58. Remember what we're doing today? I'm trying to give you confidence that this screen tells you the truth if you know how to read it. But now I want to do something even better, a graph. So let's do stat plot. And let's turn on stat plot number one. Turn it on. Let's make it a histogram. It's already a histogram. And let's use L1 and L2 as making a histogram. Now, before I do that, let's go back to my table. Do you see my tables got, I got it here on the right, all kinds of numbers. And the highest was about 0.24. So let's choose a smart window before we press the go button, the graph button. Let's say, what is a smart window? I want to go from zero to 19. So I can show you all 18 possibilities. I'll make the scale one, because each possibility is going to be one unit wide. The class width here in the histogram is one. But for the Y, the highest I ever got was 0.24, right? Let's make this, it doesn't matter, something bigger than 0.24, how about 0.3? And let's make the scale 0.05. Oops, too many dots. Sorry, let's get that 0 
So this is the last thing I'll show you today, but it's very cool. Now let's graph. That is the probability distribution function for having everything from zero ones showing up, one one, two ones, I can't draw that well, all the way up to 18 ones. And it says what? That the most likely thing is gonna be you get three ones, but you can get two ones a lot of times, right? Oh, sorry, let me get rid of that drawing. Because I want to show you something else your calculator will do for you automatically. If I hit trace, trace is first row, fourth button, then the calculator will show me each one of these values. The probability of zero ones is 0 0.03765. Probability of one one, 0 0.1352197. Probability of two ones, 0 0.2298735. The calculator is doing all the probabilities for me. Let's concentrate on the probability of doing three ones, 0 0.2451. I could do that immediately on my calculator screen with distribution, probability, binomial probability distribution function, 18 trials, one sixth and value three. If I plug in the value there, watch what happens. It'll calculate that two, four, five, two, which you see in my table. But what if you wanted to ask, what's the probability of rolling three ones or less? You win if you roll three ones or less than three ones. You lose if you roll more than three ones. That's also built into the calculator under probability distribution function called binomial cumulative distribution function. So if I do that and then do 18 trials with a probability of success of one six and a value of three, this will give me the probability of rolling three ones or less. It'll be the same as adding up the column L2 adding the cumulative each time. It's like doing a cumulative frequency. How do you like this game? If you roll a one three times or less, you get $10 from me. If you roll a one four times or more, you pay me $10. You like that game because 647 nine percent of the time you're going to win that game and why is that because most of this graph is at three two one or less zero this is a physical picture of the probability distribution function okay you've been very patient as i went through this and i've taken you right up to time uh, practice these keystrokes on your calculator. Practice doing this yourself. And this is exactly how you'll do the Tom Brady problem on your homework. Except you have different probability, different number of trials, different looking graph. Okay, you give it a try. Okay, I'm gonna cut it off here. I'm gonna stop sharing. I am going to uh, terminate this and uh, put the recording up online for everybody to see later. And if you have any questions, just send me an email. Have a nice weekend.